So, the book of Daniel. Um, obviously, as I say at the start of just about every Digging Deeper, such a big subject that to try and do justice to it in 40 minutes or so is well nigh impossible, but nevertheless, I think one of the things I like to do quite a lot with scripture is to, is to get the big picture. Because I think often when we hear sermons, uh, we hear kind of a, a deep tunnel being dug in a particular bit of a book, like these few verses or this, even this chapter, <coughs> sometimes miss the sweep of the whole thing. And the sweep of the whole thing is part of the way that God is speaking through Scripture. He didn't just give us atomized verses like those old po promise boxes, you know, sort of a verse a day. He gave us a Scripture which is given to us in sort of narrative form. There's a story that's being told, there's a history that's being represented, and to understand that helps us understand what God might want to say through it. So that's why I'm sort of attempting these big picture things, foolish though it may be, um, in an attempt to put some of the smaller pieces together. Because I suspect with Daniel we'll all know that it's got some great children's stories in it. Um, uh, the lion's den and the fiery furnace and uh, for a lot of people, I'm guessing, and probably not people in this room because you're very learned and mature Christians, but for a lot of people, that's about all they know about the book of Daniel. Um, the half of the book that follows those stories is a little bit opaque, if not completely ignored. Um, but it has those, and the other half of the book is full of these uh, prophecies and visions. And uh, that half of the book tends to be in the hands of somewhat uh, zealous and slightly fanatical, often American, sorry, um, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, doomed day uh, soothsayers who get hold of the Bronte's and Daniel and create itemized timetables for the destruction of everything and the end of the world. Um, and uh, I want to suggest that the book of Daniel probably does more than tells children's stories and does more than lays out a timetable, although there's elements that in it, um, and uh, it's a much richer book than that, and more complex actually than that might suggest. And the, one of the reasons I'm doing this, and those of you that have good memories and have been around for a while might remember that I did a similar talk in 2017, uh, <laughs> in BC, uh, <laughs> before Covid. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but I, I, I feel that Daniel is a book for our times, actually, uh, and so I thought it was worth dusting off and having another look, because I think it does speak <clears throat> to our world situation today in ways that I'll try and explain as we go through. So I'm going to do three things. I'm going to paint the historical context for the book, which is very, very important, uh, more so perhaps than for many other books in the Bible. Uh, I'm going to spend more time on what's actually in the book, the structure of the book and its content, and then I'm going to, again, try and offer what might be some of the messages for us today from the book of Daniel. So that's the, that's the goal, and I'm hoping that by Thursday we'll be able to go home. Um, so, historical context. Um, the book starts um, with these words. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put in the treasure house of God. So this dates the, the um, incident in the book of Daniel very precisely. This is when Nebuchadnezzar invaded uh, and finally began to carry off not only the Israelites, but also some of the artifacts from the temple, into exile. Uh, these events uh, around the 5th or 6th century BC are well documented historically, and, and it, it, this locates what we're looking at here, and it's important to have this location. Um, uh, also in the Book of Kings, we're told, um, reflecting on this, during Jehoiakim's reign, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, invaded the land, Jehoiakim became his vassal for three years, but then he turned against Nebuchadnezzar and rebelled. And the Lord sent Babylonian, Aramean, Moabite, and Ammonite raiders against him to destroy Judah in accordance with the word of the Lord proclaimed by his servants the prophets. Surely these things happened to Judah according to the Lord's command in order to remove them from his presence. 
because of the sins of Manasseh had done. So this is the very end of the book of two kings. And if you know the story of one and two kings, it is the story, believe it or not, of all the kings of Judah, the good and the bad, and the kings of Israel. And the culmination of the story of all the kings is that they sinned so greatly and led the people so badly and allowed such grace, such grave sin to penetrate God's people that God himself said, this cannot go on. You're going to lose everything you should have inherited because you have turned against me. I haven't turned against you. I didn't want to do that, but you have turned against me. You are the prodigal son who decided to go off into, into exile. So into exile you shall go. So this great exodus of people began from Jerusalem. And uh, I guess, you know, with what's going on in, on our TV screens at the moment, you know, all of this feels a bit close to home uh, in, in many ways. Um, and amongst those going into exile, there, were a group, there was a group of young men whose names were Azariah, Hananiah, Mishael, and Daniel. Um, that's the names they were given in Babylon, of course. Really, when they left Jerusalem, they were called Abednego, Meshach, Shadrach, and Belteshazzar. No, so those were the names they were given in Babylon. They were renamed when they got to Babylon, uh, which is a sign of um, being taken over almost completely, isn't it? You're no longer who you were. You're now someone else. Um, <clears throat> But they were in that train of people who'd lost hope, who were being taken captive, they were being taken away from their homeland. Um, and this was under the reign of this great Babylonian empire. At the time, Babylon was the superpower in the ancient world. Babylon, roughly equivalent to modern Iraq, although the borders were, much <coughs> were drawn differently, but roughly there. And the Babylonian Empire ruled the world around 612 BC. But the Babylonian Empire itself fell to the Persian Empire. Um, and the Medes and the Persians, we get mentioned in the book of Daniel, uh, their empire then took over the Babylonian Empire and pushed its boundaries further because they already had boundaries that were belong beyond Babylon. So this is now modern Iran and some of the Gulf states and uh, right up into northern Turkey. So this, this second great empire arose. And we see in the book of Daniel this transition from the great, all-powerful, um, Nebuchadnezzar-led Babylonian empire to the Medio persian empire. So that's the second uh, political shift. Uh, yeah, please feel free to play with the lights. <laughs> If what you just did and then noise you go and turn them back on again. <laughs> um, so, Second Great Empire. I, I'm sorry if this seems a bit tedious if you hate history, but it's deeply relevant to what's going on in this book of Daniel, which is why I'm just briefly doing this. What happened next was that this great empire, which I imagine everyone thought was going to be forever, fell. And it was taken over by. You were there? No, there was another one first. Uh, the Greek yeah. Empire, which eventually under Alexander uh, covered, um, Alexander the Great covered all that the Babylonian uh, Empire had been, all that the Medo-Persian Empire had been, and added bits of Greece and Egypt, uh, so on. Notice this, every time these empires shift, Israel, the land of Palestine, is taken over as, as well. So here's, here's a third great <coughs> shift. Now, when Alexander died, that great empire was divided between four of his generals. And the empire basically stayed in shape, but it was carved up into four different areas. Um, one of them being the Seleucid Empire, which is the orange one across to the, the right here. So here's, the, here's a a third empire. Are you following this? Yeah. Babylon, Medes and Persians, Greeks. The Greek Empire divides into four. And within that, a particularly virulent and violent leader arose whose name was Antiochus IV Epiphanes. Epiphanes means the appearance of God, which tells you a bit about that, what he called himself. <laughs> And uh, these words, and, uh, you may not be able to read all of these, but uh, I put them on the screen, so that if you want the PDF afterwards, you, you 
you've got the, the content there. So there sprang from these four kings a sinful offshoot, Antiochus Epiphanes, son of King Antiochus, once a hostage at Rome. He became king in 175 BC of the kingdom of the Greeks. Now, not the whole kingdom of the Greeks, he didn't take over from Alexander, but the saluted bit. And what Antiochus did was he violated the temple in Jerusalem. I'll read these words because you won't be able to see them at the back. He insolently entered the sanctuary and took away the golden altar, the lampstand for the light with all its utensils. Remember, this is after Israel had returned from exile. <laughs> so under, I should have made this clear, under the Medes and Persians, they were allowed to go back, Nehemiah and Ezra, and start rebuilding the walls and the temple. So they were now back in Jerusalem. The temple was up, or a temple was up. It wasn't as grand as Solomon's temple, but it was up. There was a temple there. The walls were built and so on. And Antiochus desecrated the second temple. He took uh, the offering tables, the cups, the bowls, the golden censers, the curtain, uh, the cornices, and the golden ornaments on the facade of the temple. He stripped it all off. And he took away the silver and gold and the precious vessels. He took all of the hidden treasures he could find. Taking all this, he went back to his own country, shed much blood, and spoke with great arrogance. He commits other crimes. Not long after this, the king sent an Athenian senator to force the Jews to abandon the law of their ancestors and, be no longer, and live no longer by the laws of God. Also, to profane the temple in Jerusalem and dedicate it to Olympian Zeus. <coughs> The Gentiles filled the temple with debauchery and revelry. They amused themselves with prostitutes and had intercourse with women, even in the sacred courts. They also brought forbidden things into the temple, so that the altar was covered with abominable offerings prohibited by the laws. You can see this, this violent, almost epicenter of all the evil that had gone before. Almost like everything that set against God's people <coughs> was into this one life, Antiochus. Yeah? Can you can yeah. see that. Awful. <laughs> well, there was a, a revolution against this. There were some Jews in Jerusalem who just couldn't stand what Antiochus was doing. And the high priest at the time was a man called Mattathias. And Mattathias refused to allow anybody to offer pagan sacrifices on the altar. And in fact, he was so vehemently against it that he stabbed the person who tried to do it. <coughs> and he stabbed Antiochus's envoy who'd come to make sure it was done. <clears throat> Obviously that didn't go down well. Um, <laughs> and uh, he fled into the desert with his five sons, John, Simon, Judas, Elena, uh, sorry, it's a daughter, and Jonathan, his five children. Uh, and they started a kind of a guerrilla resistance movement in the desert against Antiochus and all that was going on. The son called Judas was the one who actually took up the reins and the lead in that fight and uh, he became, he had the nickname Judas the Hammer which in the language at the time is Judas Maccabeus he was the one who eventually fought a war against uh, the invading armies um, now around that time power was shifting again a new empire was coming into being not the Babylonian now, they've gone, not the Medes and Persians, they've gone, not the Greeks, they were on the wane. But now, Rome takes control. And in about, uh, was it AD 60, I'm very sure the had them all written down, but my notes are in the wrong order for some reason, so that's not helping anybody very much. Um, in AD 60 something, um, AD 58 to 51, Julius Caesar conquered Gaul, France, then Egypt, and the Roman Empire became established. You know these things don't happen overnight. There had been incremental moves towards this over a period of time, but this is when it all came to be uh, recognised as the new global power. I find it quite interesting just reflecting on this bit of history alone in terms of our own world and the givens that we think exist in terms of global power. Uh, the, the world that I grew up in, there was an assumption that the two global powers were America and Russia, and then, miracle of miracles in the 80s, Russia seems not to be a global power anymore. It just left America. And now suddenly, <laughs> China's come out of nowhere. And uh, maybe America's the one on the way. And, and, and you know, you, 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 the, the, the fixity of human global power is an, a, a myth. 
you know, these empires come and go. If you lived under the Babylonian Empire, you thought, this is it. It's going to be forever. But it wasn't. The Medes and the Persians. And then you thought, okay, well, this is it. This is powerful. This is even bigger than the Babylonian Empire. No, it wasn't it. And so on. So this, even this bit alone <laughs> alerts us, without putting any theology into it, just the history of it, that the empires of this world that seem so dominant and seem so fixed are not. They come and they go. So this sort of succession of, of empires, just to bring it together onto one slide, so the Babylonian Empire under which the Jews experienced exile, the Persian Empire under which they experienced return, and then the Greek and Roman Empire under which they experienced occupation and suppression. They never really became autonomous again during those times. As we know from our own gospel accounts in the times of Jesus when the Romans were still very much in control in Jerusalem. History lesson over. <laughs> Breathe a sigh of relief. But I hope that's helpful as we go on into the book of Daniel and look at its structure and content. Everyone okay? Yeah. Yeah. Need to take a deep breath? Scratch the neck of the person in front of you with their permission? Okay. <laughs> You're watching on the live stream, thank you. Um, <laughs> so, from one level, the book of Daniel seems to be structured quite simply. Uh, chapters 1 to 6 <coughs> tell us stories about Daniel and his friends. Daniel interpreting dreams, Daniel in the lion's den, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery bones. So, there's, there's kind of that kind of picture book almost bit of the book. And then, chapter 7 to 12 takes a bit of a twist, and we get these visions of Daniel and his dreams and so on. Um, that's tr so far so true, but what we don't see in our English Bibles is that the book of Daniel is written in two different languages. Chapter 1 is written in Hebrew, as is chapter 8 to 12, but the big chunk in the middle, chapters 2 to 7, is written in Aramaic. Now at the time, Aramaic was the... <coughs> Uh, the kind of common language of all nations. It's a bit like English is today around the world. Uh, you know, you kind of hope and assume that there'll be people there that understand this. I mean, it's a bit arrogant of us, but that's just the way it is, isn't it, really? Uh, Aramaic was a bit like that. It was the, the common language of many, many peoples, whereas Hebrew, of course, was distinctly the language of the Jews. And so the fact that this book is written in two languages should alert us, perhaps, that some bits need to be particularly heard by God's people and some bits have a message for everyone. Yeah. So, what happens in the book of Daniel? So let's just walk through it as quickly as we can. Um, chapter 1, Daniel's recruited to serve in Babylon. We know all about that. He goes to the courts of Babylon. He's obviously a very bright young man. He's, a, um, a, what's the word? He's um, promoted, that's the word I'm looking for promoted into a position of power in Babylon, he refuses to eat the fine food that the king brings to him, but he chooses to eat a simple diet of vegetables. Apart from that, I think Daniel's a great guy. But, uh, <laughs> <coughs> his faithfulness, though, uh, being serious for a minute, his faithfulness to his country's Hebrew food laws, despite the fact that he's doing that, leads him to promotion and exaltation within the land of, of Babylon. So that's the first chapter of the Hebrew chapter. Now we get into the Middle Aramaic section, and here, this is very interesting, uh, I think. Um, so chapter 2, we see the king's dream. Remember, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. He can't, he, he's not willing to tell anyone what it was. He asked all his courtiers to come up with what it was. They couldn't. He threatens to kill them. And then it comes across Daniel, who somehow, under God's inspiration, can tell Nebuchadnezzar not just what the dream meant, but what the dream was in the first place. Uh, and Nebuchadnezzar is so uh, impressed by that, uh, that he promotes Daniel. Um, and the, the dream is of a statue. Head of gold, chest of silver, Thighs, legs of bronze, feet of clay and iron mixed together. And the statue falls because a rock hits its feet. Coming out of nowhere, this rock comes and hits its feet and the whole thing falls down. And Daniel has to break it to Nebuchadnezzar that he is the gold head of this statue. 
is about to fall. And what we see in there is that Nebuchadnezzar worships God at the end of the chapter. So this pagan king is so impressed with Daniel's work and with the message of the dream that he's given that the king worships God. Okay. Chapter 3, still Nebuchadnezzar, this time a decree. The fact that he's worshipped God at the end of chapter 2 doesn't seem to have changed his character too much because this time he commands everybody to bow down and worship him. When the trumpet blows, bow down and worship my statue. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused to do it. You know the story. Throws him into the fiery furnace. He's very, very miffed because a fourth person has gone into the fiery furnace without his permission. <laughs> um, and uh, they're miraculously delivered from this, this death threat, uh, which they're placed under by Nebuchadnezzar. And at the uh, end of it, again, Nebuchadnezzar acknowledges God and promotes Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego this time within his kingdom. So again, Nebuchadnezzar's heart is turned towards God. In chapter 4, we read again of Nebuchadnezzar's pride. This time he has another dream, and this time it's of a huge tree. Um, interestingly, in the middle of the dream, the tree becomes a person, <laughs> and the person becomes like an animal, and crawls around the garden and gets covered in dew. And uh, Daniel again tells him the dream and tells him that you're the tree. You're going to fall down. You're going to be toppled. And of course that happens. Nebuchadnezzar does become apparently mad and goes crawling around the garden and gets covered in dew and starts eating the grass and things. This great king, humbled like an animal. Then in chapter 5, we read that Nebuchadnezzar's son has taken power, Belshazzar. And he has a priest, uh, doesn't have a priest, he has a party. Priest, party, close up with people, very different uh, He has a, a party, and in his party he uses all of the golden goblets and so on from the temple uh, for his revelry. And uh, remember the hand appears on the wall, mene mene tekel up, mini mini tickle a parson, that one. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, and he doesn't know what it means, so Daniel comes in and he says, listen, you're... You've been weighed in the balance, and you've been found wanting. Your days are numbered. Now, interestingly, unlike Nebuchadnezzar, his dad, when he's confronted, and he humbles himself and eventually worships God, Belshazzar doesn't. And what happens in this story is that the person, the king that doesn't repent, that doesn't heed the dream or the symbol or the sign, is killed at the end of the chapter. He's assassinated. Chapter 6 we then get the story of the lion's den, when Daniel refuses to stop praying and is thrown into the lion's den. Do you remember who throws Daniel into the lion's den? Mm. King Darius. Okay. Yeah. So we're now in a different empire. Okay. So we, the, this, this is about the, the, the time of the fall of the Babylonian Empire and the rise of the Medes and Persians. Daniel is now still, though, in exile. He's still there because uh, the return hasn't yet been granted. And Daniel refuses to worship and he's thrown to the lion's den and we know how that story goes. And then chapter 7 we get to, and we get, now Daniel himself has a dream. Now this is different. Suddenly Daniel has the dream. And the dream, we'll look at this in a bit more detail in a minute because it's a very significant chapter. The dream is of four savage beasts that arise out of the earth. And he's told in his dream, in the interpretation of the dream, when he seeks the meaning, that these are four great empires that will arise in the world. And these four savage beasts wreak havoc in the world. They're violent and aggressive. And out of the fourth one, there are four horns that appear. This fourth one seems to manifest itself in four different ways. And out of one of those four, this big horn appears. The horn's a sign of power and aggression. And wreaks havoc on the world. Is that ringing any bells at all? Really? <laughs> okay, good, it's supposed to. But what you can see here is that Daniel chapter 2 to 7 is carefully written, and those chapters, the way I put them on the screen, they pair up. In chapter 2, the fall of the statue 
and in chapter 7, the four beasts, in both cases, despite the savagery of the beasts and the grandeur of the statue, at the end of the day, it's God's kingdom that's established. The rock that hits the feet of the statue, and the, as we'll see in a minute, the thrones that are set up in da Daniel 7. This is, these chapters talk about the ultimate victory of the kingdom of God. Chapters 3 and 6 are a call to faithfulness to God. Just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, just like Daniel uh, in the lion's den, these two chapters are calling us to faithfulness to God in the face of hostility and aggression. And at the bottom, the story of Nebuchadnezzar, the powerful ruler who repents, and the story of Belshazzar, the powerful ruler who doesn't, this is a challenge to secular leaders. Remember, this is the Aramaic section. This is something that everybody needs to hear that your power is not absolute. Your power is a derived power, it's a submitted power. You need to heed God's sovereignty in your leadership of your great empire, or you too will fall. So that's how the book's put together. And I, I hope you can see and understand the kind of the parallelism that's going on there through that middle Aramaic section as those two bits uh, fit together. <coughs> And, uh, yeah, I've done, done that bit. Uh, the interesting thing is there are two broad themes in the book of Daniel, and they're both reflected there. One is a call to be faithful in the midst of an oppressive and secular world. That's the Daniel in the lion's den. That's the shade of music in Bendy going. Life as a believer will be tough, if I can just put it in very simple language. Don't expect the world to understand you, get you. You stay distinctive where you are. That's, that's, that's part of the message of the book of Daniel. The other bit is that the world will not be a good place to be. The world will be full of empires that are repressive and violent and greedy and, mil and, and exercise militaristic power. Don't be surprised by that. Because you might suffer under that. Now that's not the message we probably want to hear, but that is part of the message of the book of Daniel. So how does the book end? Well, Daniel's second vision in chapter 8, we're told explicitly some of these things. We don't have to sort of agonise over how it's all going to be um, uh, interpreted because the book actually tells us these two great empires that come are now the Medes and the Persians and the Greeks. So we're not in any doubt about what these, the, the vision of these two warring, uh, the, the, the ram, uh, which is uh, Medes and Persians, and then the goat, which comes along and savages the ram, is, is the, the Greek Empire. Um, we're, we're told that as we read it, so I'm having to go very quickly. And then in Daniel 9, Daniel prays. He's read his scriptures, and he's read Jeremiah, and he's read in Jeremiah that the days of Israel's suffering in exile will be 70 years. And he's got his calendar out, and he's worked out that they're getting pretty close to 70 years. So Daniel prays and says, Lord, 70 years, is it nearly over? <laughs> Effectively, I'm paraphrasing. Is it not time? We, we've sinned, yes, we, we, we've borne the punishment for our sin. Is it not nearly time for us to be restored? And he gets an answer which says yes and no at the same time. Um, and at the end of chapter 7, there's, there's um, sorry, chapter 9, uh, there's a there's passage about 70 weeks of 7. Um, and there's a series of events that are described there. I'm looking around because I had a Bible, there it is. Maybe don't mind me actually opening a Bible. Uh, series of events that are described here. Uh, verse 26. So 70 weeks are decreed for your people. So 70 weeks sort of uh, is, is the fullness of time until exile. Uh, to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for iniquity. It's all going to be done 70 weeks. Um, Know therefore, understand, from the time that the word went out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the time of an anointed prince, there shall be seven weeks. And for 62 weeks it shall be built again with streets and moat, but in a troubled time. 
So there's a period of time when the exile will be over, but Jerusalem will be rebuilt, but, quotes, it shall be built again with streets and moat, but in troubled times. That's probably pointing to the time when, if you remember when Ezra and Nehemiah were rebuilding the walls, it was a troubled time. They were attacked by people who had left, been left in the land and didn't like what was going on. Now after that period, after the 62 weeks, an anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing. Who is the anointed one? The anointed one clearly is a figure of Christ. So sometime after this troubled rebuilding of Jerusalem, the anointed one shall be cut off. Well, we know what that points to. Yeah. And shall have nothing. And the troops of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The troops of the one who is to come. Well, who came after the anointed one had lost everything? Well, in AD 70, the Romans came and completely obliterated the temple. We're going to get to that in a minute. Um, its end shall come with a flood and to that end there shall be war desolations are decreed um, he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week and for half of the week he shall make sacrifice offering seeds in their place so there will be a period of time a further period of time when the temple will not function as such finally the final words of verse chapter 9 until the decreed end is poured out upon the desolator. So those verses seem to point to the period between Daniel's time, the return from exile, then that troubled time of rebuilding, then the coming of the anointed one, then the ransacking of Jerusalem in AD 70. But then it says there'll be another period of time. So when Daniel says, how long? Is it nearly, uh, is, is it nearly time for us to go back to the land? That's why I said the answer is yes and no. <laughs> Yes, it is time for you to go back to the land. Yes, you will go back. Yes, the temple will be rebuilt. But don't think that's the end of history. There is a longer story to tell, and it's a troubled story. It's a story that goes on until God decides the appointed end has come. Now, in all of these number systems in the book of Daniel, just as in Revelation, we're reading what's called apocalyptic writing. And numbers are symbolic. They're not literal. And I think the worst thing to do is to try and get out a calculator and work out a timetable. And the reason I say that is because if anybody understood the book of Daniel, it was Jesus. And it was Jesus who said, I don't know when the end will be, only the Father knows. Now if anybody could have worked out number systems and dates and, and put figures against, you know, historical figures against this, that and the other, then surely it would have been Jesus who might have been clearer had he wanted to be on when we should expect the end. All he said was the end will come and it will come like a thief in the night and you need to be ready for it. Live every day as though it just around the corner. Be ready. And that was Daniel's, that's the answer that Daniel had anyway. It's going to be longer than you think. It's going to be a troubled time. And then the book finishes, chapter 10 to 12, uh, with his third vision, Persian and Greek kingdoms at war, a king of the north wages war, and there'll be a time of anguish, but there's the promise of hope right at the end of the whole book. So that's sort of an overview of the book of Daniel. That was supposed to be the introduction, so we're not doing too well. <laughs> um, but I hope you've got a feel, firstly, for the kind of history that, that sits with this. It's not just kind of like some kind of computer fantasy game. There's something historical, which gives us our roots for this. It's more than that, which I'll come to in a minute, but that's where we start. Chapter 7 is a pivotal chapter in the book. Things change in chapter 7. The date sequence is broken. At the beginning of chapter 7, we're now back in Nebuchadnezzar's time, even though the previous chapter we've been in Darius's time, so it's not historically linear. We're told we're back now in, uh, around chapters 4 and 5 in time. The nature of the material changes, it's now from about Daniel and his friends to by Daniel. The ethos changes. In chapters 1 to 6, life is possible, even if difficult, in the empire. Even if it costs you your life or you get thrown into the lion's den. Chapters 7 to 12, faithful life may cost you your life. It may cost you everything. The beasts are afoot. 
The style changes from mainly stories, narrative about lion's dens and kings and, and so on, to this kind of more apocalyptic type prophetic writing. Yet the vision is the counterpart, as I showed you earlier, to chapter 2, and also in Aramaic. So there is some connection there, but it stands alone. And in chapter 7, we read of these four beasts that Daniel sees, that comes up out of the water, each one different from the other. And Daniel is told that these do represent four historical empires. In verse 16, we read that Daniel approached one of those standing beside God's throne and asked, what is all this about? Because he was as confused as we are if we just read it off the page. And he was the, the one standing next to God's throne explained to Daniel like this, these four huge beasts <coughs> represent four kingdoms that will arise from the earth. Notice that these beasts are just that, beasts. Notice that when Nebuchadnezzar abused his power, he became a beast. He crawled around the garden like a wild hog. That alerts us to the fact that there's something going on here about human power. Remember at the beginning of the Bible, God created humankind in his image. He gave humankind, to be made in the image of God, means a number of things, but one thing it means is that he gave us to be rulers in his earth. He shared his power with us. To be made in the image of God is to be a co-regent with God in the world, to help run the world as God would have the world run. You see the same thing in Psalm 8. You've made human beings a little lower than God, crowned with glory and honour. You've given them dominion over the works of your hands. But the, the truth is that when humans do not live out of their God-given identity and rule God's world under God, they lose their humanity and they become like beasts. They become unpredictable, violent, like a, like a, a, a vicious dog. You know, they thrash around, trying to get their own way through whatever way. And the me one of the messages of the book of Daniel is that these beasts are humans, but they have lost their humanity. Mm -hmm. They've lost the dignity that they were created to bear in the earth. They've lost their mandate to rule, but they are still ruling. And it's gross, and it's evil, and it's savage. The beasts are deliberately pictured as violent, aggressive. You know, when those empires shifted, I mean, I, I rattled through it on a few PowerPoint slides, but it was like we're seeing at the moment on our TV screens. It was bloody, it was brutal. <coughs> the beasts are truly awful. And when you look at the news, that's all you see. The news only talks about beasts. And the temptation is to think that that's all there is. But in Daniel chapter 7, having seen these beasts, Daniel continued to reflect in his dream. And we read this, I watched as thrones were put in place, and the Ancient One, or the Ancient of Days, I love that description of God, the one who's always been there, and always will be, sat down to judge. Judge who? Judge the beasts. His clothing was as white as snow, his hair like purest wool. He sat on a fiery throne with wheels of blazing fire, and a river of fire was pouring out, flowing from his presence. Millions of angels ministered to him. Many millions stood to attend him. And the court began its session when the books were opened. When did this happen? When the beasts were dead? No, when the beasts were roaming the earth. Somehow, both these things are true at the same time. The beastliness of human abused power and the transcendent glory and hope of the majesty of God. Somehow these things must be held together. If we just lean one way, we lean into unreality. This kind of Christianity that's about escapism and everything being nice and right. If we lean the other way, we lean into despair and hopelessness. <coughs> Somehow or other, both these things, as they are in the book of Daniel, as they are in chapter 7 in Daniel's dream, are both true at the same time. And then... This throne, of course, throne always speaks of ultimate authority, and this is ultimate authority because the one on the throne is judging the beasts, so clearly he sits above the beasts, right? You get it? The hierarchy works here. But then something else happens in the vision. Surprise, surprise, what happens? Well, bizarrely, in this scene of immense transcendent glory, 
Someone like a human being. <laughs> Someone like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient One and was led into his presence. He was given authority, honor and sovereignty over the, all the nations of the world so that people of every race and nation and language would obey him. His rule is eternal. It will never end. His kingdom will never be destroyed. So we have a human being. That's all that son of man means. You know, in the Hebrew language, if you want, if they don't have any adjectives. So if you want to say human, you say son of man. If you want to say he looks like a fish, you'd say son of fish. You know, it's, it's kind of like just a, 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 a way that it's described. So this human being comes and he is given the authority of God to re-establish the rule that God wanted in the earth, which these beasts have failed to deliver. Got it? Yep. So God's strange method of overcoming the beast is to exalt a human being <laughs> into a position of power. The power and authority that Adam and Eve should have exerted through all time but failed to do is going to be exerted now. God's starting again. History is being reborn. A new human head is being placed into human history. <coughs> and his rule is eternal and his kingdom will never end. Now, you and I know, and I'm going to point out the obvious to you anyway, that Jesus himself claimed to be that son of man. Mm. One of Jesus' favourite self-descriptors was, I am the son of man. The son of man has authority on earth to forgive sins, and so on. In John 3, Jesus said this, The father has life in himself, and he's granted that same life-giving power to his son. The father has granted the life-giving power to his son, and he's given him authority to judge everyone, because he is the son of man. And so at the end of Matthew's Gospel, we're not surprised that the one who has been given authority to rule in the earth begins to do that through an unlikely bunch of fishermen and tax collectors and people who wedded themselves to him as his disciples. And Jesus says, all authority has been given to me. That's son of man language, right? That's Daniel 7 language, right? All authority has been given to me on heaven and earth. Therefore, go and make disciples. How is this kingdom going to come? It's going to come by a rolling revolution of lives being transformed by submission to the king. It's not a political revolution. It's not going to have its own land. It's not going to have its own headquarters. It's not going to have its own political power. What it's going to have is it's going to have this underground radical movement of people who are submitted to the king, who has authority now to reign, and they will live his life under his reign, and slowly, in the midst of the beast's work, this kingdom will become established. Got it? So, in chapter 2 of Daniel, to hop back, that's the parallel chapter, right? Where we had the, this, this great statue which toppled. Why did the... What made the kingdom topple? The rock that struck the statue and which became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. That sounds a bit like mustard seed language to me. This little thing, this seemingly insignificant movement of ordinary people who dare to believe that there is a different God in heaven, who dare to order their lives under him, and who dare to believe that his way is best and true, and who in the face of the beast, even if it means losing their life, will not give up that message. Those people are the presence of the future in God's earth. Not the powers that be, as we sometimes call them but the servants of the one who is the power of its. And skip that slide, because time has gone pretty much. Let me just get to its message. I've already been getting to it a little bit. I guess I can't stop myself. But one question you might ask is, so is it just a history book? Is all of that exhausted by those four great empires and Antiochus Epiphanes and the fall of, uh, the, fall of um, the Greek Empire and so on? Well, no, it's not. Because interestingly, there is a fulfilment later, as I've already pointed out, in AD 70, the Romans came and flattened Jerusalem. This is a relief from the Arch of Titus, as Titus, Titus Andronicus, the Roman emperor, came and ransacked the temple again, like Antiochus had done. And he is now described in Daniel language as, uh, as, as the horn and the beast. <laughs> oh, oh, we thought it was Antiochus. No, no. And then you get to the end of the Bible, the book of Revelation, which is clearly not talking anymore about the fall of Jerusalem because it was written in about AD 90 after Jerusalem had fallen. So Revelation is not pointing forward to the, any of those empires I've just talked about. But the book of Revelation 
also has these images of beasts that arise and try and savagely rule the earth. And although you can't read all the words, I hope you can see the colours, because all of the red words are drawn directly from the book of Daniel. The book of Revelation is nearly all Old Testament, cut and pasted. And Daniel is one of the chief books that's used in the book of Revelation. Because biblical prophecy often works on a kind of a rolling basis. It's true, and then it becomes true again in a different generation, and then it becomes true again in a different context. And it keeps being true. It's more like a uh, spiral staircase than like a, a linear walkway. History repeats itself. Remember that, that poem by Steve Turner? History repeats itself. It has to, because no one listens. <laughs> um, <for that> day. <clears throat> so the book of Daniel, the message of Daniel, is a message for all times. It's in Aramaic, right? It's a message for all times. There will be beasts. There will be savage powers. There will be condensed forms of that. There will be Antiochus Epiphanes who arise and, and assault God's people. The people of King Jesus will not have it easy in the history of the world. In a very, if you want to go deeper into this, it's a very good commentary by Ernest Lucas on the book of Daniel. He says this, whether we like it or not, or understand it or not, the Most High has given a measure of sovereignty to human rulers. And as a result, from time to time, history does seem to be in the grip of chaotic, bestial forces. At times, God's people are devastated. It's far more important to grasp this message than to decode the vision in terms of specific historical references. Wise words. I think for those of us that like those YouTube videos of people who have decoded specific historical references. <laughs> uh, Daniel, uh, Daniel, not Daniel, Ernest. Um, also says this, chapter 7 tells us that the difference in ethos in the two parts of the book does not come from contradictory worldviews. Rather, it represents two ends of a spectrum of the experience of a godly person living in a pagan society. Sometimes it's possible to be faithful to one's principles and fully involved in that society. <coughs> At other times, society can be so hostile that the principles are trampled on and the godly may be crushed. So in our world, when we look at the news and we read reports of what the beasts are up to today, in rolling 24-hour technical, we can easily be overwhelmed, terrified, think that God is not on the throne, and our faith has been a naive attempt at making things feel like they're better even when they're not. And when whoever you think are today's beasts, I hesitated to put this slide up because I thought there's going to be someone there that someone doesn't think is a beast, but they are all beasts in the sense that they have global, their power has or aspires to global reach. They desire to build empires of different sorts. They do it in very different ways and so on. Let's not get way into the politics. The point is, and the question is, are these people submitting their rule to the reign of the king? So Daniel is a kind of, uh, again, Daniel Luke, uh, Ernest Lucas's phrase, I like this, it's a theology of history. I like that phrase. It's a theology of history. It helps us get our bearings where God is in unrolling historic times. And if there are four, just to finish, four brief things I'd want to take from it. First, it's a warning for humanity. Power corrupts when divorced from submission to God. That's true of any authority. Whether you're a parent, whether you're a church leader, whether you run an office at work, power when divorced from submission to God is dangerous. It's a caution for political rulers. They will be called to account for their exercise of power. That's the message of the book of Daniel, anyway. Thrones are set in place and judgment begins. It's a promise of hope for God's people too. God is on the throne. Ultimately, it's his kingdom that remains. Choose your sides carefully. And it's a challenge for people of faith. 
On the one hand, the challenge to serve our culture whilst not being squeezed into its mould. On the other hand, to submit to God even if our culture comes after us and gets us in the temple. So, there we are. A little introduction. Thank you. I know you know all that anyway, but thank you. <laughs> I hope it's kind of fleshed out the, the lion's den and, you know, the bits that you, maybe you did know better. Um, but I thought it'd be, before we sing a final song exalting uh, the kingship of God, I thought it might be just absolutely right to pray for those today who are suffering under the beasts yes. that are currently roaming the earth. Of course, right in the headlines are the people of Gaza at the moment and the people of Israel who are suffering grief. And of course, uh, it's amazing how quickly news moves on. There is still a war going on in Ukraine. There are still people dying there. Before they carry back. You know, we look around the world and there are so many of these places where the beasts are foaming at the mouth and exalting their power. So could we just pause, maybe stand together, um, and then we'll sing the final.